where you're basically going to be alone forever. And of course, the spoiler is that at the end it, it, it is revealed that there's actually a high dimensional world called Spaceland, where the platonic ideal of this circle um, elevates to the sphere. So moving forward 100 years to another scientific uh, sci-fi novel, I won't spoil the plot this time, uh, but I just want to highlight uh, the setting for part of this, which is what's called the shell world, or sometimes the Matryoshkin uh, shell world, referring to the Russian doll nature of it. Uh, that's constructed basically of a series of internetted spheres uh, connected by pillars for support. So today I want to talk to you about uh, um, how I'm trying to build a new model for tree space, and I did just do a cold opening for a conference talk, and someone said I couldn't do that. <laughs> so I'm going to get my conclusions out of the way first, <laughs> and then I'm going to acknowledge some people that have ins inspired and helped in uh, terms of discussion. So I'm going to start with, uh, in terms of the talk proper, my favorite statistics paper, if you don't know this, this is called Anton's Quartet. So he made this really excellent point that it, you, can, um, you can get stuck if you rely purely on subject statistics in, in making very bad inferences about your data. So everything you see here is an exact identical set of subject statistics, uh, but visually you can see very quickly that there's very different things going on with this data. So it's a really important gen uh, lesson we can apply generally, uh, but it becomes very hard when we're dealing with high dimensional data. So for example, just because we're taking lots of different measurements, or more in the case here, that just intrinsically your data tends to lead to these high dimensional spaces that are hard to visualize and therefore hard to understand. So I'm going to talk about tree space. I'm very briefly going to introduce trees. Most of you know what a tree is. So they're effectively a special form of graph, therefore they're composed of vertices and edges. They're really a directed graph, so we have times arrow in there, even if we don't ever draw it. Uh, and also asynchronous graphs, we don't allow things to basically be their own ancestors. Uh, and then just to key you in, so you're going to see a lot of trees in this talk. Uh, it's colored, it's a labeled vertice, it's not an unlabeled vertice. So I'm applying some further constraints here, so I'm going to ignore branch lengths, so I'm only dealing with topology. I'm not going to allow things like reticulation, and I'm also not going to allow trees like this, where effectively sampled ancestors in that data set. So what is tree space? Well, it's simply the space of all possible trees. Uh, the major difficulty in doing anything with tree space is its sheer size. So here's the sort of standard graph we can show how uh, the number of possible trees increases with uh, the number of tips of those trees. Uh, these are very high numbers. It's hard for us to sort of conceptualize. But just to key you in, this is the number of um, atoms in the observable universe so we exceed that really quickly. So most people that work on tree space care about the fact that we, it's therefore difficult to uh, find the optimal tree if you're doing something with biogenic inference. Uh, but today I purely want to focus on visualizing tree space, and hopefully it's clear that there are lots of uses for that. Um, I'm going to highlight just a couple that allow me to steal them from a really nice paper by Phyllis et al. Uh, in systematic biology. So one here is uh, one way here is that we can visualize our actual tree searches and tree space. So we have a starting tree on the left, and towards the sort of top right there is where our posterior distribution is. And these trees are also colored by their likelihood, so formally this is actually a, a landscape of trees. We could also, for example, look at different partitions of our data, so each colored sort of uh, cloud of points here represents uh, the trees from a particular gene, and then in, in the middle is basically the combined data set that so I, I like when I think about these things to sort of set up a set of optimality criteria in terms of what I'm really looking for. So imagine here I'm basically Sauron and just a giant eye. All I really care about is visualizing my space. So uh, some goals of that, therefore, I want my space to be Euclidean, so the distances between the points reflect the true distances between them. I want effectively a Cartesian space, so I can hand out a bunch of trees and get the coordinates of where they should plot in the space. Uh, I want that space to be as low dimensional as possible because, like you, I'm stuck with two dimensional vision. Uh, and then the more subtle point is I want a tree space that operates like Sudoku. So, Sudoku is basically, even though when they're incomplete, there's a special set of rules there that mean there's only one possible number that can go in each cell. So, we have a similar special set of rules for tree space. Even if we can't sample all possible trees, hopefully, we can still say where a specific tree would fit in that space. 
So there are already uh, nice existing tools that do this. So these are what you probably should use instead of what I'm trying to do in this talk. So there's the tree set based module in the skeet, and then for example, there's the tree space package in R. So the normal way people do uh, tree spaces is using something like classic multi-dimensional scaling, uh, so which is just a form of ordination. Uh, but there's problems with doing this, and this is nicely pointed out in the, in the Hillis paper from before. So this space is doing really well in terms of dimensionality, but it's doing really badly in terms of Euclidean uh, nature. So all the pairs of points you can see here uh, exactly as far away from each other as they are from the center of the space. You can see that sort of uh, misleading to us. But also with ordinations, every time you add a tree or subtract a tree, you have to perform the ordination again for changing the relative and absolute positions of all those points, so it doesn't really fit either our other goals as well. Other things we could do is conceive instead of our space as basically having axes decided by splits, so effectively you're modeling it as a hypercube, but even with uh, very small numbers of tips, so for four tips in this case you need seven axes to model that space, we can extrapolate that forwards using sterling numbers of the second kind, and again, basically this takes us into a sort of dimensional hellscape uh, we can't really visualize and uh, affect it. So the question I'm interested in, is there a better deterministic solution to this? And what I mean by that is, uh, if you can solve it for a certain number of tips, then anyone can use that space regardless of what their organisms are, or what their species are, uh, and, and basically have a tree space for any tip. So I'm going to start with basically working through from the, the simplest case and, and see how far I can do. So in the one lead case, there's basically we could draw a tree like this, nobody really would, it has a single tip, it has a root. There's only one way to label that tree. And so our tree space, we're stuck in point land, in a zero dimensional world. So if you work on something like the shoe build, congratulations, your tree space is now sold. <laughs> <laughs> we go up to the two lead case, again, there's only a single tree. We can only label it one way, because the principle of free rotation, we swap those around, it hasn't changed the identity of our tree. So we're still in our zero dimensional point land. So now, congratulations if you work on Latimeria, your tree space is solved. It's really easy, right? It's really the case we now only got two trees for our unlabeled, which corresponds to four labeled trees. We have to think a little bit harder now, but basically our three bifurcate trees equally dissimilar, so you can draw them as a triangle. We've left up now to flat land, two-dimensional world, and we can also add in our um, start phylogeny basically so if you work on something like living elephants, congratulations, your tree space is solved. What about the four leaf case? Now we have quite a few more unlabeled trees, many more labeled trees, and it's no longer as, as simple to solve. So one way to think about this is just to look at those earlier examples and see if there's any structure in there that might help us in terms of extrapolating to a higher leaf count. So one is that our star phylogeny is always going to be in, in the middle of the space. Previously recognized this represents origin of tree space, I'm going a bit further and saying it's the absolute center of tree space. And then our trees on the right there, we can kind of see that as a triangle, but when I look at it, what I see is a circle. So effectively, what I think we should be doing in terms of modeling tree space is thinking about it in terms of the shell world um, that, we, that I introduced earlier. So there was a reason I did that. So effectively then, our, our tree space will be an internested set of forest moons of Endor, or without the Ewoks. Uh, and there's a lot of sort of nice features that are potentially good about this. So one is we're creating a Sudoku-like rule straight away, where we partition our trees out into different shells based on the number of internal nodes they have. Spheres are also an excellent uh, thing to build spaces out of because they work in basically any dimension. You just have to be one radius away from the center and you're on the surface of the sphere. It also means we can co-opt co an already really mature set of visualization tools, i.e. map projections, that are also in themselves basically a way of reducing the dimensionality of the space. And many of these we can uh, generalize to different dimensions as well. And then more finally, this is a relatively nuanced point, but a sphere is effectively infinitely symmetrical, so we can rotate it however we want, and we've uh, maintained our variance basically across that. So it turns out then this isn't really a biology problem, this is a math problem. Specifically, it requires competencies in the fields of mathematics shown on the left here. The only problem is my competencies in mathematics are the ones shown on the right. 
So we can start by thinking about the space by initially just partitioning our trees across the different shells, but of course we want to know how they're arranged on those different shells. So I'm going to start here with the first shells of the trees that only have two internal nodes. So most people would start by thinking about a distance matrix to do this. So here's a Robinson Poles distance matrix. So our diagonal is going to be zero. Our off diagonal is always going to be two. This would extrapolate for any uh, shell. So I mean, of any leaf count. So is there a way to actually plot uh, ten points so they're all exactly two distance apart? There is. There's something we can basically use to do. It's called the simplex. So this is basically a hyperdimensional version of the triangle. But this gives us two major problems. So one is this is nine dimensional space just for this uh, tree. If we extrapolate that forwards, we basically end up again in a sort of dimensional hellscape in terms of visualizing our data. But I think more importantly, the Robinson Falls has failed us here. Our trees aren't really equally uh, dissimilar from each other. So what I want to do instead is use a, a metric called contradiction. Uh, but I'm going to do something a bit different. So instead of comparing between my, zero, uh, my first shell trees here, I wanted to compare between those trees and the trees on the second shell. And specifically, I only wanted the trees that have no contradiction effectively uh, between the first shell. So if I do that, I basically get um, these three, three trees in each case. Um, and these basically represent uh, bifurcate resolutions of that tree. So this might seem like it's sort of telling us only about vertical relationships between shells. But actually, we see trees repeat here. So they tell us about adjacencies that we can capture uh, with an adjacency matrix. And we can basically draw that as a physically as a graph in two-dimensional space. Uh, but if we do that, we see there's some weird properties, such as, for example, the three trees at the top here, or also the three trees at the bottom here. So this is telling us we need to leap up to a, a, th a third-dimensional space, the space line, and wrap this around the sphere. So the way we have to do that, though, is actually take our graph, duplicate it, flip one half upside down. We can match vertices across there. So we temporarily remove them, redraw it as, as pentagons, stick those together. We've got a dodecahedron. We can fold that up. Uh, and we can basically plot our trees on top of it. So this means we've introduced uh, duplicate trees, and specifically, each tree is going to be antipodal to itself. Um, we have also basically can sort of wrap a circumsphere around this, intersect all our points to show we have actually got a sphere here. Um, so then we can go up to the second shell. So we've basically got a set of Sudoku rules that tell us the solution for this. So we have, specifically we want a, num uh, a shape where we have our vertices are twice the number of our trees. We want to preserve that dodecahedralness that we saw before. Uh, but we also now want triangles basically to represent those three zero contradiction trees. So we can do that with icosic dodecahedron and project our trees now back onto it. And this also has a circumsphere, so this gets us uh, basically uh, solving effectively this for the points. So this is basically unfortunately as far as I've gotten now. Um, so at the um, now basically I guess we'll stop there. Uh, one minor thing I guess we need to go back and, and fix our first shell for our, two, our 3D case, have all the duplicate trees in there, and that means it's now here. Thank you.